Great, great to be here today. Uh, thanks, Neil and Cindy, for inviting me. Uh, so I'm a PhD student here in the computer science department, where I'm advised by professors Andrew Ling and Percy Liang. Um, and today I thought I'd share uh, some of the research that's going on in the lab. Um, and really, the focus of today is just starting out with just defining broadly what problems um, of high impact and value exist in healthcare. Uh, some of the stuff that we're working on in the Stanford ML group, and then finally end with getting you a sense of how you can get involved if you're looking to uh, become part of the AI and healthcare revolution. So starting with what are some high impact problems in healthcare where deep learning can help, um, I like to have a framework of what sort of, of questions can we ask in healthcare. And at the lowest level, one question that we, we can ask is just trying to, and is, is what I call descriptive questions, where we're asking what happened. And here, there are a lot of apps on the App Store where you can monitor uh, what your uh, nutrition habit through a day is, what your sleep habit during a day is. Um, and these are really meant to just uh, describe. At the next level are diagnostic questions. These deal with why did something happen? Why was a, pa why was a patient coughing for two weeks? Does their x-ray show any signs of pneumonia? Then there are predictive questions. Here we care about the future, um, answering questions like, will this patient live in six months? Will they develop um, some side effects as a result of some treatment? And finally, I think the holy grail of where all this leads to is prescriptive questions, where we're trying to answer, well, OK, this is the scenario. This is what will happen. This is what will happen if I give the patient a medication. Now tell me, what should I do? And this is an up and coming area where there has been very little work done um, for reasons that, that we'll get into soon. At the Stanford ML Group, we work on diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive problems. And I'll describe a few of these. <coughs> um, I want to start by first talking a little bit about uh, deep learning. How many of you work in deep learning or have done a deep learning project? Okay. How many of you know about deep learning? Cool. Um, maybe what I'll do is describe what I think has been the most important development in machine learning slash deep learning in the past few years. So machine learning frameworks, this might be familiar to most of you, is you have a bunch of labeled data, you develop an algorithm that maps x to y, and out in the real world you have your model, new data for which you don't know the right answer, pass it through your model, get a prediction. Traditionally the way this has worked is you have some kind of an input, an image, an audio, and then there's been a machine learning engineer that's been responsible for feature extraction. And in healthcare this has often looked like okay, I need to understand how MRIs work, how X-rays work, let me think of how I can code up a way in which I can extract features from my raw data that I can then pass into a machine learning algorithm like an SVM or a logistic regression and get, finally get my output. Now the problem here has been that this is the bottleneck, the feature extraction, because we're limited by what we think are going to be useful features for the machine to use and learn from. That's where deep learning has really changed the game. <coughs> Eliminating the feature extraction step, saying let's go directly from input to output. A few things have changed to make this possible. Data, computation, and algorithmic progress. I think there's going to be another paradigm shift in the next five years. Currently, most of what I do in a day involves the step of building a neural network, of developing it in such a way such that it makes effective use of my input-output uh, to extract a relationship. And a lot of algorithmic development takes place there. 
a lot of machine learning engineering time takes place right there. The problem with this is that we still have people involved in engineering the design of these neural networks. And one question we might ask is, well, can we automate all of this away? Can we have, can we have AI itself design the neural network? Let's take it a step further. We've got all these data scientists who make data processing decisions. What's the right processing that I need to do on this input to make sure that it's, uh, it's normalized correctly? Well, why can't we have an algorithm automated away? So a lot of people talk about AI <coughs> as um, being a, a reason that doctors are going to be replaced. I'm sure you've heard that news before. Um, I think it's going to be machine learning engineers who AI is going to come after first. Um, just a thought. You've probably seen this graph before. It shows that around 2011, 2012, there was a shift in terms of how deep learning was became popular and started to break state-of-the-art performances. Here's, uh, in about 2016, the best models on ImageNet started to outperform uh, a human error rate. The same story in audio recognition with a flip of around 2011 where suddenly we saw that computers were just much better at being able to recognize uh, audio and extract meaning from that. Which brings me to the work that, that we've been doing in the lab, which is trying to look at how we can bring expert level performances from AI into medicine. So I'm going to share three case studies with you today. The first in cardiology, uh, the second in x-ray pathology identification, and the third in MR imagery. And these are some of my collaborators, Ani, Jeremy, and Nick, who have uh, developed these projects that I'm going to share today with you. And for the last two, we've been working with Professor Matt Longren over in the Met School. So when I first started out in, um, in healthcare, this was one of the first projects that we, uh, that we took on. And I, and I joined this project, and it was sort of me, my collaborator, and Professor Andrew Ng, um, on a conference table. And he was like, you know what we should do? We should just go read a book on ECG interpretation, and we should, we should do the exercises in that textbook, and he get a textbook. Uh, so the next day, I went to the, to the med school library. I don't know how many of you guys have been to the med school library, but if you go to the basement, there are those hand crank rolling shelves, which you, you know, turn and then it, it opens up a new shelf and then you can find books in there. I see someone nodding. Um, so that's what we did. We started out, tried to get as much information as we could about the domain, um, and then started tackling this problem. So arrhythmia detection, uh, arrhythmia is referred to an irregular beating of the heart, and it affects around 3 million people in the U.S. just every year. And it's got a wide variety of symptoms. You might expect that everyone would know if they have an arrhythmia, but that doesn't turn out to be the case. You can be asymptomatic and still have an arrhythmia that just, uh, that just is symptomatic later in life. And the way that arrhythmias are diagnosed is with an ECG test. So if you're in a hospital, you're laying down, electrodes are attached to your skin, and uh, it takes a few minutes. And then what the cardiologist does is he, uh, he, he or she looks through those... Uh, that, that two minute and sees whether they can find something. But often what happens is that in those two minutes, people don't display all of the arrhythmias that they might have. So if they don't, then they're given this Holter monitor and said, hey, go home for the next two days, uh, wear this, and let's see what we find. Uh, it's still quite uncomfortable with the Holter monitor, but there are new devices like the Zeo patch, which just goes on the chest and then people are able to do this monitoring for two weeks. You can shower with it, sleep with it, and you have a little button that you can press if you feel a symptom. Okay, so, fun fact is in 14 days, the heart beats 1.6 million times. Uh, that's a lot. For a cardiologist to go through that would take two weeks. 
Uh, so that's implausible. In a usual ECG test, it's only 100 beats. So just take a minute to appreciate the difference. And it's, a, it's that calls for an automated approach. So one challenge. So look at the hospital setting, look at how many wires there are, and look at how many wires there are there. What happens as a result of that is that the amount of signal you have to work with is very little. So here's what, here's all the ECG leads that would, uh, ECG outputs that would show on when you're in a hospital, and the way to think about it is uh, your electrical activity in your heart is 3D, and you have different camera perspectives to, to look into that 3D. And what you get with a single lead is you just get one camera angle into the heart. The second difference is that the differences between heart rhythm are subtle. Who here knows how to read an ECG? Okay, cool, cool. All right, so this is my ECG primer for those of you, and you can pick up your cardiology degrees on the way out. So uh, the ECG cycle is made up of different waveforms. The P wave is when the atria are contracting, and the QRS is when the ventricles are contracting. Um, and then the T wave refers to uh, the expansion of, of the heart. And then the way you'd identify rhythm is look at features within a cycle or between cycles to tell what's going on. This is what the normal heart rhythm looks like. The way you know it's normal is it's sort of regular. It's between 60 and 100 beats per minute. There's a P wave, that little thing for every QRS, and the QRS is narrow. Just a few features that cardiologists look at. Here's a very similar rhythm. This is called the EAR rhythm. Here, the only thing that's different is the P wave. So the P wave is either shorter or is sometimes uh, inverted. The main point here is that EAR and sinus are very easy to confuse. But, turns out, this confusion doesn't really matter in the clinical setting because EAR is a benign arrhythmia and a doctor wouldn't do anything about it. But, let's say your heart rate wasn't smaller than 100 beats per minute, it was higher than 100 beats per minute, then it is called SVT. And SVT, unlike EAR, is actually treated by a doctor. So here, the heart rate makes a difference. ECG interpretation is challenging. Hopefully you're convinced of that. Um, and if we look at what people have done in the past, a lot of the approaches are, as I described earlier, very feature engineering based. Someone thought it'd be a good idea if I took a wavelet transform of a certain mother wavelet and then pass that into an SVM. People have also done a lot of pre-processing, let's put a band pass filter, let's extract RR intervals, um, or you know the, the peak of the R wave. And people have been working with small data sets. The largest data set out there when we started working on this problem consisted of 47 patients. Uh, that's not even enough examples to validate a machine learning algorithm, much less train one. So here's a history of hand engineering and small data sets. And if we think about what we can do differently, two things that we did were collect a data set that was 600 times larger and then did some deep learning on it. So we partnered with iRhythm, which is a company that manufactures these devices that had 20,000 patients wearing them. And we got that data, um, and it was annotated by clinicians um, who went over each window and said, OK, this is this type of rhythm. And then we had a test set where for a certain sample of records, we had a committee of cardiologists sit together in a room and determine, hey, what's, what's the right answer here? And then we also did the same thing with individual cardiologists to just get a sense of their performance. Here's what machine learning setup looks like. So you have an ECG signal, and you're trying to output a list of rhythms present in that ECG signal such that each label corresponds to uh, a segment of the input. So here, if we had rhythms A, B, and C, that were distributed this way, um, that's what they would be labeling. 
And now the idea is going to be we're going to use a neural network to map from the input to the output. So here we use a 1D convolutional neural network. So you might have seen convolutional neural networks applied to images. But turns out they don't necessarily need to be applied to images. They can also work well on audio data, or in our case, ECG data. And then we had a 34-layer deep network. The key component of this network was, um, or the key takeaway was, skip connections are important. Um, and the idea of skip connections, what makes them work so well, is you can imagine a neural network is a sequence of layers, and you get an understanding of how off you are at the end. That's your error. And what you need to know is you need to let every layer know what that error was, so it could update its weights. Um, and the closer you are to that error, the fewer the hops, number of hops away, the better you're going to learn. That's what skip connections do. It reduces the number of hops you need to get to an earlier layer from the last layer. The other, the other optimization is to use some regularization like dropout in these blocks. So here we have a recipe for doing really well. And it turns out we did do pretty well. Uh, outperforming cardiologists in terms of the precision and the recall on um, on identifying multiple arrhythmias. What's your ground truth? The so, that's right. If we look at where the mistakes are made, one of the most prominent mistakes is between EAR and sinus, since they are very similar rhythms, as we saw earlier. Uh, but that's the same place. The experts made the mistake as well. Um, on heart blocks, there is expected confusion. This would make sense to a uh, cardiologist. One thing that's interesting here is you don't want to guess that a rhythm is benign when it's actually serious. And here's a case of that where here we can see that the experts confuse VT and IVR together. They're only separated by heart rate, otherwise they look the same. While the model doesn't make that mistake. Here's more of a breakdown in terms of model expert performance. Uh, the key point here is just that it did well. Uh, atrial fibrillation is the most common arrhythmia that affects uh, millions of, of people. And that's one of the focuses of a lot of work on automating arrhythmia detection today. So the goal here is that continuous monitoring is got a lot of potential for being able to improve quality of care associated with someone's cardiac health. And paired with automated real-time detection, you can imagine a future in which if I know that I have a, um, a heart rhythm that requires quick defibrillation, then I can do that on device. Um, I was very excited by Apple's announcement of their ECG, um, ECG capability on their watch. I think this is going to be a big uh, step towards creating accessibility to uh, these real-time diagnoses uh, worldwide. <coughs> okay, so that was cardiology, that was one case study. I want to walk you through another study that we did uh, where we were looking at radiology and one of the most important tasks which is to be able to uh, diagnose from chest x-rays. So pneumonia is one of the uh, big burdens in terms of uh, in terms of hospitalizations and deaths, especially in children globally and in America, mostly adults. And the way it's diagnosed classically is with an x-ray. Uh, chest x-rays are the most common imaging procedure uh, with two billion per year. And the way x-rays are diagnosed is by looking at areas of uh, increased opacity. So this is where things should appear dark, but appear bright. And here's what pneumonia looks like. Some people call it a fluffy cloud. Um, and it occurs when the alveoli fill up with pus. So 
you might wonder, okay, that sounds easy. What's hard about it? It turns out that if it's not the pus filling up alveoli, but it's cells or blood or fluid, it's a very different diagnosis, which means that a lot of other abnormalities mimic what pneumonia looks like. So here's what we do. We take an x-ray, a frontal view x-ray, that's what it looks like, pass it through a convolutional neural network, which has to output the probability of uh, pneumonia. The network architecture is a 2D convolutional neural network, much uh, similar to what you'd find on, um, um, used on ImageNet for image classification. And here we use a dense net architecture. So earlier we talked about short connections uh, with ResNets. And DenseNets take the idea to an extreme. It says, let me connect every layer to every other layer. If shortcut works, why not shortcut everything out of it? Um, and we found that this actually works pretty generally well for x-rays. And I don't know why that is. Maybe there's something about this architecture um, that's really useful for x-ray topology identification. So we used this data set from the NIH, which consisted of 100,000 images from 30,000 unique patients. And this was the largest public data set at that time. Each of these images was annotated uh, by using natural language processing on the radiology reports to extract whether each pathology existed or didn't. And then we had a test set of 400, 420 frontal chest x-rays, which we had annotated by four Stanford radiologists. And the reason we did this is because if you ask a radiologist, hey, is this, are you sure this is X, where X is, let's say, pneumonia, they would say, hmm, I'm not that sure. And there's a lot of uncertainty associated with it. So one way to determine if an algorithm is doing as well as an expert is just to see whether the algorithm agrees with the expert as much as experts do with each other. So that's a test of agreement for expert level performance. So here's how we apply that here. Let's have Four radiologists and the algorithm. Take one radiologist, use the other one as ground truth, get a score, uh, repeat, 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 and average. How are we going to do this for the model? So the model exchanges places with the radiologist. One score, two scores, three scores, four scores. I can average them. Here's what happens when I average them. So I can get a score for every radiologist and for the model. And we found that the model was as good as, or in some cases better, than the radiologist at being able to detect pneumonia from x-rays. So that was pretty cool. There are a couple of limitations, though. One of them is that neither the algorithm nor the radiologist were looking at uh, prior examinations, which is quite a big part of the workflow. And the second is only the frontal views were presented and sometimes you'd want a lateral view to be able to tell some of these pathologies. Um, at the time of our release, we were able to outperform other release scores on this data set uh, on all 14 pathologies, actually. Now, one of the most important things with automated medical <coughs> diagnostic um, AI is we really should be able to trust uh, the model to be able to make predictions. Uh, personally, I feel like I could never get into a self-driving car uh, because I just don't know what it would do and what I would almost like is a self-driving car going at five miles per hour and just shouting every decision it's about to make and for me to <laughs> quickly say, stop, abort, when it's about to make a bad decision. And we want to be able to do something similar when it comes to medical decisions as well. And one thing that's nice about medical decisions is you can do a little bit of time delay. Uh, you don't have to make decisions in the split second. You can take a few minutes to consider whether the decision of the algorithm is right. We use class activation maps to make this possible. Class activation maps uh, generate a heat map over the image 
where the model is able to show its probability uh, or that it's found evidence in this particular part of the image. Uh, so here's the model being able to pick up pneumonia in the x-ray. Uh, here's one where it's able to uh, pick up a collapsed right lung. And here's one where it's able to pick up a nodule. Um, and nodules are interesting because x-rays are not the primary way that lung cancer screening is done. Uh, it's CT. But it turns out that x-rays are the imaging modality which lead to most incidental findings, so findings that you are not looking for of nodules, which is why this is very useful. And it's a 100x um, lower radiation dose, so that's pretty nice. So the goal here is to improve healthcare delivery. One of the utilities of this is being able to help radiologists prioritize their workflow and also make better diagnoses. And the second one is that two-thirds of the world uh, actually lacks access to radiology diagnostics. Um, and I recently learned, especially if you're a kid, turns out only 3% of radiologists are trained to read uh, kid images. Uh, so that's very, very difficult to actually find. And that's where I hope that such technologies can be very useful. Um, we built this at a hackathon. I'm about to demo this to you. Um, where we thought, wouldn't it be cool if we just made an app where people could upload their x-rays and then uh, I could tell you whether it was a probability of you having pneumonia or these other pathologies. Um, so here's the app. I'm going to upload an x-ray. I have a few saved. My whole desktop is just medical images. Uh, but I'm going to upload one of, um, so this is an enlarged heart. That's what cardiomegaly is. Uh, and here's what that looks like. And usually the heart shouldn't extend all this way. It usually stops much earlier. So that's how I know, uh, that's how I can confirm this is cardiomegaly. Um, and on the right, if you saw, within a second or two was the model had already sort of made its decision of what the x-ray contained. Uh, so if I look on the right, at the top is cardiomegaly, so it's gotten that right. And if I look here, you can see that the probability, according to the model of this being an image that has cardiomegaly, is uh, 0.85. So that's pretty sweet. Um, one thing that's obviously important, as we talked about earlier, is our ability to interpret the model. So if we look at, so it's looking, uh, it's looking at the heart. Uh, so I guess we can say it's hearts in the right place. I think what's another useful measure of whether a model truly works is testing it out on data that it's not seen before, but more importantly, data from a distribution that it's, it's not seen before. Um, so these are, data, these are images that all come from uh, the, the NIH. But I thought it'd be pretty cool if we could just go on Google image search right now and someone randomly pick an image from image search and we'll try to run it through the algorithm and see if it comes out with the same result. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll stick with cardiomegaly. Uh, so let's, let's pick an image. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through these, actually, maybe one, and this is, we'll call this two. We'll call this three. And the first person who shouts out a number will use that image. Three. Okay, I heard a three. So we'll use this one. We'll see if that works. It's not the largest card I've seen, so not sure it's the best example. And also, there is some sort of a surgery that's happened here. Uh, a cardiologist, do you have an idea what's going on here? I'm not a cardiologist. Not a cardiologist. That's fine. All right. <laughs> We're try this. I don't think that. That's all right. Our, our model's a cardiologist, so it'll be able to tell. So I'm going to try on this image right now. 
and it's about to do its thing. Um, and it looks like cardiomegaly was, was third here with a probability of 0.25. Um, and it's looking at the heart, so that's good, but the model doesn't think this is an example of cardiomegaly. Uh, so who's right, the model or Google search? Yeah. What's the resolution of this image? That's a great question. Yeah, so this image is being fed in at uh, 256 by 256, so it's, it's pretty small. That's your model is taking 256? That's right. That's right, and is able to take as an image of any size. Um, what I have on here from earlier is an example of a of a kid. So this is a kid with an enlarged heart, and the model's never seen images of X-rays of, of kids. Uh, so the fact that it's able to detect that this is an example of cardiomegaly uh, is pretty impressive. So when we did this work, we didn't have a great idea of how this works around the world, of how do people actually go about doing x-rays in their workflow in parts of the world that are not the US. And um, we started collaborating with a, with a hospital in, in Congo, and they have a video on their website of sort of their their, their system, and this is a screenshot from that. And you can see, so, the, so for an x-ray you need, you need backlight uh, to, be able to, uh, to be able to read it, and that's how they're doing it. This was quite striking to me and made me think of the potential that this could really have uh, with the use of an app. So a couple of reasons. One is you need you need uh, you need the light. Uh, the second one is in most parts of the world, X-rays are done on on films, not digitally. So there needs to be backlight to be able to read them. In the last five minutes, I want to take you through uh, another application that we looked at more recently, where we looked at uh, knee MRIs. And this is work with with uh, with Nick Bien. And uh, knee MRIs are different from X-rays in that they're 3D, they're complicated. Very few people can actually read them, uh, but actually quite prevalent in terms of their necessity to be able to evaluate knee disorders. Um, I was here last week when Benel Kosla was speaking, and. Uh, if you guys remember the story of how he got into healthcare, it was because of a ski injury where he tore his ACL, and then um, three experts gave him three different opinions. Uh, this was before I heard that story, but we thought it'd be pretty cool to identify abnormalities, ACL tears, and meniscal tears. And fast forward, we did. Uh, and we did pretty well at this. Here's an example of an ACL tear. Here's an example of it picking up abnormalities on which it was not trained on, but did pretty well on. I want to talk about external validation. So here's a comic that I thought illustrated uh, the idea of external validation pretty well. So everyone thought in machine learning, hey, I have a model. It works really well on my data. That's all I need. But then the real price is being able to do really well on an external data set. And that's what we're really after, because that's a true test of these medical imaging algorithms. If it only works for your hospital where you train your, where you train your model, then it's not generalizable. And so we found this data set, uh, TLDR in Croatia, different scanner, different sequence, different protocol, try to find out if the model could generalize. So it achieved this AUC of 0.82 without any training. The best score was 0.894. We did a little bit of tweaking, and it got to 0.913. And this is fully automated. 
A lot of people talk about augmentation of doctors with AI. Um, but surprisingly, there are very few studies out there that actually show that doctors get better with AI. Um, and it's, 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 it's quite funny. There, there are two different schools of thoughts on whether doctors will get better with AI. And uh, if I asked you, do you think a chess player that's a hybrid between uh, a person and a AI will be just an AI, I think most of you will, actually, how many of you think an AI by itself will be a um, AI working with a, a good chess player? Perfect. Okay. All right, try it out. Uh, but no, we wanted to test that. If we showed radiologists the and your and, and surgeons, excuse me, the output of the model, would be would they be able to make better classifications? So we had experts read the same cases twice, separated by ten days, and tested whether this was true. And in general, we found that. This was true. So towards the right indicates that uh, you're getting you're getting better with model assistance. And there was one statistically significant difference, which is in the specificity of ACL tears. So someone who did have an ACL tear, did your model correctly say they did not have an ACL tear? And that was statistically significant of an improvement. But the others, while generally better, we didn't have other statistical significance. And there are some ways this can be used. Um, how can you get involved in doing AI for healthcare work? So one of the ways that you can get involved is do a project on your own. So we released a large data set of uh, musculoskeletal radiographs where the task is tell me if this x-ray is normal or abnormal. And um, here's what the x-rays look like. Uh, here's what they're able to do so here it's able to identify a fracture. And you can develop, you can go develop your own model. If you go on uh, the website, you can download the data, you can submit your model to the leaderboard and see how you do in relation to other people's work. Uh, recently we actually had two submissions that beat the best radiologist uh, uh, score that we had. And these are radiologists at Stanford, so they're pretty good. So that was pretty exciting. Uh, the second thing is uh, our group runs a AI for Healthcare bootcamp, uh, which provides students an opportunity to do uh, research with us at the intersection of AI and healthcare, uh, where PhD students as well as med school faculty work work closely with students um, on um, on structured projects. And this time, we encourage both people with a background in artificial intelligence or healthcare if you're in school of medicine. Uh, to apply. Um, and we've been working on uh, a bunch of projects across the med school uh, with a lot of talented medical school faculty who I'm very grateful to be working with. Um, we have a lot of fun. Uh, we work really hard. Uh, this is some of the pictures from the lab in, uh, in spring quarter. Uh, the application deadline for fall is uh, day after tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, so if you want to apply, you should. If you if you want to apply in winter quarter, then those applications will open two weeks from now. So that's another option. Um, and here's the website. Uh, but with that, I'll stop. Thank you so much for having me here. X-ray study, uh, they only had access to the image, and it was uh, it was a it was a yes no yes no problem of is this is this actually why? 
Uh, so you're right. There's a little bit of uh, there's a little bit of maybe associated with it, um, and we're we're exploring some of that in uh, in the work that we're currently doing. But that was the setup of, of that study. Yeah, that's a great question. So we'll keep that question for, for video. Is uh, in the ECG's work, we we had segments uh, that were marked as having a certain rhythm. Are we working on those individual segments, or are we using any context around it? Uh, so we're using uh, 30 seconds uh, of the ECG signal, and that's passed in, and then it's sequence to sequence where the output is a list of rhythms for the 30 seconds. Um, it seems like the accuracy of the models is generally quite decent, so the problem is going to be getting a, a good model to work well, it's more getting so many people to use it. Do you think actually the most important part of this is that the interpretation of the so more innovations are the most that's actually something that's going to persuade people to use this yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, to repeat the question is, uh, it looks like these models are doing well. Uh, is interpretability the big thing that needs to be conquered for these models to be used in clinical practice? Um, I think that's part of the story. So, personally, my feeling is that uh, clinical trials, prospective validation, are going to be useful in just saying, okay, these things are safe, they're effective, and uh, I think second, uh, the, the legal component of actually getting FDA approval is, uh, is quite challenging. And, and, and we're teaming up with some people in the law school to be able to figure those challenges out. Yeah, Jason. Oh, sure. So the takeaway is if you look at the 95% confidence intervals, the only one of the, the lower side that's greater than zero is that particular point. Uh, so that's the specificity of the ACL pair. And, uh, is that a significant shift? Or is that, I'm not sure. Like, if the horizontal axis is signifying the significant shift. Yeah, so the dot is the mean. The mean difference, where if it's greater than zero, it means improvement. And then those are the bars, concrete bars. For the ECG study, um, how did you filter any of the noise you might have faced in the input data? Yeah, so we had a we had a noise class. So just to repeat the question, how did we filter out noise in the ECG? Uh, is we had a noise class. Yeah, so the question is, were we able to do better on some arrhythmias rather than others? Uh, yes, so it was mostly a function of training data uh, size, where for some arrhythmias we got a lot more data than for other arrhythmias. Uh, so, yeah, so for example, like ventricular fibrillation, after which a person only survives few minutes, uh, we had like no data for, which is why we couldn't tackle that problem. Uh, but for others like uh, atrial fibrillation, we, we, we had tons and tons of data, and that's what the one we get really run well. Yeah. Okay. We got a minute. Let's take one more question. Yeah, so the question is, um, what are the 
open challenges in extending this work on from detecting a few pathologies to detecting lots of pathologies. Um, and I think one of the challenges is obviously training data. Um, but here's another one. So like a physician sees an example and we talk with a lot of them, they're like, this is the first time in my life I've ever seen that. And we want a mechanism at which these models can say, hey, this is the first time in my life I'm seeing that, but I'm still pretty sure there's something darn wrong with this. Uh, so that's an open problem. Anyways, uh, thank you so much for having me here. And I hope you